Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God at Bethel Church. Um, before I turn to that worship, I want to point out a few announcements. Uh, we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper today. Um, this seal of the new covenant was given by our Lord in the night in which he was betrayed for the church to proclaim his death until he comes and to be a bond and pledge of the union of Christians with their Lord and with each other as members of the body of Christ. These are visible signs for the visible church, displaying and strengthening an intimate and ardent commitment of ourselves to the Lord and to one another. For this reason, I invite you to participate in the supper with us. If you've been baptized, if you've repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, and if you've evidenced that faith by joining the church, either this or another church, and being admitted to the Lord's table by the spiritual overseers. Uh, the ladies' Bible study is going to begin on Tuesday, September 26th, meeting at the church from 1 to 2.30 uh, p.m., uh, studying uh, Jen Wilkins' book, None Like Him, Ten Ways That God is Different From Us and Why That's a Good Thing. Um, Bethel's fall workday, mark this on your calendars, if you will, is uh, Saturday, September 30th, beginning at 9 a.m. We're usually done by noon, but there's uh, things to uh, clean out and clean up and get ready for the, uh, for the, for the uh, winter, the coming winter, so uh, please join us for that. Um, remember to pick up items for Tree of Life's food pantry when you go grocery shopping. Mr. Lane puts out something uh, just about every week for that, and uh, we're not doing the dinners uh, right now like we used to, um, although anybody's free to go over on a Tuesday night and help out if you'd like to, but we're not uh, organizing those uh, any longer. But this is the way we're chiefly helping that ministry, and there is a, 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 a great need there. Uh, also, just let me remind you again that there's a weekly uh, call, uh, prayer call, uh, Thursday at 8 p.m. to pray for each other, the broader church, and our missionaries. And I was talking with, uh, with Brian Lynch, and he said that if there's another day that's, that's better for you to do that, let him know. And if there's some kind of consensus, that, uh, that, that uh, he'd be glad to look into adjusting that. But uh, let's turn our uh, attention to the, to the worship of God with our um, a, a different musical ensemble than we usually have, but nonetheless a, a very wonderful one. So we thank the Lord for them and thank you. And let's prepare our hearts to... Worship the Lord. Would you please rise for the call to worship? I am the Lord, and there is no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together. Let's pray. Father, in gathering together for worship today, we recognize that Christians are not meant to grow in faith alone as individuals. You call us to be members of a body, to grow in faith with our brothers and sisters and with our families and in a state of unity. 
So we pray that you would make us one today as we worship you, that you would draw us closer to one another and ultimately closer to you in this worship and in the feast to come. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please be seated. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You will have no other gods before me. You will not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You will not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You will not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you'll not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, your servants, your animals, or the alien within your gates, so that your servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were once in bondage and that the Lord your God redeemed you with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You will not murder. You will not commit adultery. You will not steal. You will not give false testimony against your neighbor. You will not covet your neighbor's wife or set your desire in your neighbor's house or land, his servants, his animals, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So church, let's uh, pray together the prayer of confession, and then I'll give you some opportunity to seek the Lord yourself. Lord, your word alone cannot change me, for if righteousness could be attained through the law, Christ died needlessly. But fill me with the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, the Spirit of the risen Christ, so that I may be sanctified by the truth, for your word is truth. Take a few moments to seek God. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snare of death confronted me. In my distress, I cried to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. And from his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. There are no prenuptial agreements when one comes to Christ. In the same way that a husband says to his wife, all that I am, and all that I have, I give to you. A Christian lays all that he is and all that he has on the altar. He picks up a cross and follows his Lord. In recognition of that, would the deacons please come forward to collect his tithes and our offerings.
friends, let's now confess our faith in the saying of the mystery of godliness from 1 Timothy 3.16. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. God, appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Please be seated. And we're going to pray together. Our Lord, but today before we partake of the wine and the bread together, we seek your word. We seek your truth, your blessing. We desire that our lives would be a living sacrifice to you. We ask that you would give us thoughtfulness, humility, and compassion toward one another here at Bethel and toward our neighbor. As we desire to bear one another's burdens, we humbly request your blessing upon those in our congregation who are experiencing physical or medical hardship, that you would bring them healing and encouragement. This includes Sue, Deb, Glenn, Emily, Leslie, Caitlin, Grace, and others who are ill or recovering from surgery. Likewise, we pray for those that we don't know personally, but who have been affected by recent natural disasters, including the fires, floods, and storms, that you would meet their needs, and that the difficulty and tragedy would somehow be used for good, so that many would turn to Christ and follow him. We ask for your guidance and your blessing upon Grace and Tim as they prepare for their marriage in October, that you would give them encouragement and assurance that you are with them and have ordained their coming together in this union. Help us to be a blessing to them. Likewise, we thank you for the wonderful wedding of Trey and Kanunda. We ask for your continued guidance upon their lives as they settle into their new apartment. We ask that you would help them also to be a blessing and a witness to their neighbors there. We thank you for the service given to our church by Jean Withnell, our media ministry leader, as she continuously improves, adapts, and maintains our website. We ask that you might use that site as a tool for spreading the gospel throughout our community and elsewhere. For those in civil authority, as you instruct, we pray specifically today for Coran Sains, member of the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors in the Sterling District, that you would give Coran spirit to serve honestly, to represent his constituents honorably. In home missions, we think of Dan and Stacy Halley of Bay Haven OPC in Tampa. And we thank you that reportedly the church is experiencing membership growth and that they're adding an elder and four deacons. We ask that you would help them so that their evangelistic efforts through neighborhood prayer walks and door hanging campaigns would bear fruit. In foreign missions, we consider the needs of Tina DeJong and her friend Joyce, who experienced several deaths amongst local friends and family. We thank you for Tina's ministry to them, providing rides and taking food to those who were grieving. We thank you for inspiring these folks as they minister to those in need. We also ask for your blessing upon Joanna Grove, who has completed four years of service in Uganda, and we ask that you would continue to be with her and bless her as she works with Ling, an administrative assistant for the Committee on Foreign Missions. Finally, we ask for your blessing upon Pastor Hammond, that you would guide him as he proclaims your word to us today. Whatever our personal disposition, help us so that we would have soft hearts ready not only to learn what your word says, but to truly take your word in, to meditate on it, and to live it out. 
We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, who prayed, saying, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please rise? To God be the glory. I think it was on a, on, a, on a news program, the first time I heard the phrase, I heard somebody say, I need, to, I need to speak my truth. And I've heard that from time to time before. It was, speak your truth. This person should speak his truth or her truth. And I've got to tell you, when I first heard that, I, I had a, a viscerally negative reaction to it. Because, because truth is not something that's proprietary. Um, we don't all have our own truth. For truth to be truth, it has to conform to a reality. Well, that's become very popular. You know, today we hear political sycophants speaking of things like alternative facts. But there's no such thing as alternative facts. There's facts, there's fallacies, 
but there aren't alternative facts for the same reason that there's really no such thing as my truth and your truth. But, you know, as I've listened to people use that, I think the best intentions of that phrase when someone speaks of my truth or maybe your truth uh, means to tell an aspect of the truth that other people are not aware of or perhaps don't see. It means that there are some perhaps unaccounted for, unappreciated facts and providing a missing perspective on truth. Well, even when it's used that way, I still don't really like the phrase. But facts are related to truth. And yet knowing facts is not the same as knowing truth. And it's important to know if and how your truth relates to the truth. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been in the Gospel of John, but uh, Jesus, we've seen him crucified, we've seen him die, we've seen him be buried. And our text for today is from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. This is God's word. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. He still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Father, uh, open our eyes today that we may see wonderful things in your word. Jesus had been crucified and he died on a Roman cross. That was a fact. Joseph and Nicodemus had come to Governor Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus and Jesus had granted it to them to take away. That was a fact. And they prepared the body for interment, put him in Joseph's new tomb, sealed it that was a fact Mary Magdalene and as she indicates here uh, by saying we don't know where they put him some of the other women came on the first day of the week and found that the stone had been removed taken up out of its place the tomb was open those were the facts but what was the truth See, fact and truth are related, but they're not the same thing. Um, Cornelius Van Til, if you know those names, used gallons of ink to rail against the notion of, of brute facts. Facts cry out to be arranged, to have some purpose, to fit, uh, if you will, into a narrative that has meaning. In a word, facts cry out for truth. And we can have perspectives on the truth, your truth, if you will. But it's important that your truth comes into alignment with the truth. And it's particularly important when it has to do with the gospel. Now, in this passage, we see Mary's truth. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Jesus had been crucified on Friday. 
He was buried before the start of Shabbat, and it is customary in Judaism now, it probably was then as well, not to visit a grave on Shabbat. If you listen to Luke's words in Luke's gospel, if you get behind them, so to speak, and Jesus' encounter with Mary Magdalene, you realize uh, how much evil Jesus had delivered her from. And, and Mary's gospel story was not the modern gospel story of a Jesus who's come to make your already wonderful middle-class life even better. And so going to him when it's quite convenient for you. Hers was a gospel story of redemption from hell on earth and of a Jesus that she could not live without. But Jesus had been crucified and had died. That was a fact and that was the truth. And as soon as Shabbat was over, Mary wanted to go to be with Jesus. Seeing is a chief means that God has given to us to verify facts. Seeing is believing is the old saying. We're most sure of the things that we see with our own eyes. And even more so in this day of deep fakes when video and audio can be faked on YouTube, and most of it is. Of course, we can't see everything with our own eyes, so we need reliable eyewitnesses. And I'm thankful the report for the reports that we have from missionaries around the world that God has placed providentially in some very difficult places and situations of people who are known to us who can give us eyewitness accounts of the things that are happening. The importance of eyewitnesses is underscored in that uh, when it came time to replace Judas among the twelve, the man chosen, we're told in Acts uh, chapter 1 and verse 22, must be someone who had been an eyewitness of Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. And now Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb. And she's an eyewitness, which she saw was a fact. The stone that sealed the tomb had been lifted out of its trough. It was moved. She saw, we're told, that the stone had been moved from the entrance. That was a fact. That was true. But we, what she concluded from that fact was not true. And we're told that she... She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. That's John's way of referring to himself in this gospel. And said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. It, it was stunning news, almost unbelievable news. And something that cried out for verification. That was her truth. What was Peter and John's truth? You know, I suspect, if I put myself in their place, I suspect that when, that when Mary came and said they've taken the body away, that, that, that they didn't believe her. They just suffered the biggest blow of their lives, the death of the one that they had put their hopes in for salvation. And now his body was stolen too. It just seemed to be too incredible. Surely there had to be a more ordinary explanation for what she saw or thought she saw than grave robbery. And early in the uh, first day of the week, we're told, while it was still dark, she'd gone there in the, in the dim of the very early morning. And perhaps she was confused. Perhaps she went to the wrong tomb. Perhaps there was another new tomb there that wasn't used and so had not been sealed. And then again, what was it that Mary actually saw? John says that she saw the stone rolled away. To conclude that the body was missing may be a bit hasty. 
So they ran to the tomb to see with their own two eyes. And John, being younger than Peter by probably about half, outran him. And he got there first. And with his own eyes, he saw the facts. In fact, he saw more than Mary did. And I can picture it, can you, from outside, it's still very early. If it had been very bright, he wouldn't have been able to see inside. But he peers, he squints through the darkness, and he sees linen lying there in the tomb. But he stays outside. And Peter uh, comes up right on his heels, and he goes right in and ascertains more information, more facts with his own eyes. Mary didn't have it wrong. The body was gone. But the burial cloth and the face covering had been removed, which was, which was puzzling. Why would grave robbers take the time to do that? And then John reports something, writes something that should catch our attention. It's at the end of verse 8. It says that when he went in, he saw and he believed. And John's speaking of himself there. He says that he saw and he believed. The question that we have to ask is, what, what is it that he believed? Because we hear that language in the New Testament that someone believed and we think that that means that they believed in Jesus or they believed the gospel or they believed the resurrection. But then we read verse 9. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So what is it that John believed? Well, he believed the facts. He believed what was right before him. If we take the whole section together, he believed Mary's report, the body's gone. They must have taken him. That was a conclusion, but they had the facts. They still didn't understand the truth. Now, you know, throughout uh, John's gospel, as we've been looking at it, and even more so uh, through the other gospels, throughout his ministry with them, Jesus kept telling them that they were going to go to Jerusalem, that he was going to be handed over the, to the Gentiles, that he was going to be crucified, that he would rise on the third day. He told them that on numerous occasions. But it's interesting that John doesn't say they still didn't understand what Jesus had told them. He says they still didn't understand from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And the scriptures here are not the New Testament scriptures. The New Testament's not written. It's uh, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. Where in the Old Testament does it say that? That, that he must rise from the dead. You know, later, the risen Jesus would say to them, it was written that the Christ must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Later, the apostle Paul would say the same in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Again, not the New Testament scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, where can you lay your hands on the passage where it says that he'll rise on the third day? You know, there's some students of the Bible who, as they've wrestled with that, have said, I've read some commentaries who say, well, while the, while the Bible doesn't say anything like that, th there's a sense of it there. I have no idea what they're talking about. But there is one passage in the Old Testament that speaks of being raised on the third day. And it's in the prophet Hosea, chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. And it says this, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has injured us, 
but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will heal us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his presence. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that passage does speak about being raised on the third day. And in fact, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it uses the word for resurrection there. But it speaks of us, not him. But that's exactly the point and the truth that we so easily miss. Do you understand what happened when Jesus died and when he rose? The Apostle Paul did, so he writes, I have been crucified with Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, God being rich in mercy because of his great love for us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He raised us up with him and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Lord has torn us, but he will heal us. And on the third day, he will raise us up. And we who are his people, the ones for whom Christ has died, are united to Christ. We died with him in his crucifixion. We rose with him in his resurrection. And the disciples, you know, to this point, they could see the facts, but they didn't yet understand the truth. It's a truth that's profoundly practical. Let me speak to some of you who are going through some great suffering right now. And I imagine that that will be a number of people who are joining us via live stream today. And, and you know, you go through those times of hardship, of, of suffering, of pain. Put on a brave face but you feel frightened. You feel abandoned. You look at your life, you look at your health, you look at your situation, and all you see is a broken shambles. Those are the facts. Perhaps you know the scriptures, but you haven't yet understood them. I don't deny your pain, your brokenness, the anguish, the hardship, and neither does God. Those are the facts. Knowing facts are not enough. You need truth. And you might think to yourself from time to time in the things that you go through, if God loved me, he would not allow this pointless suffering. I want to tell you that you're right. That, that that is sound reasoning. If God loves you, he wouldn't allow pointless suffering. But you, my friend, are not wise enough to know the point of your suffering. And you make the mistake of thinking that because I can't see the point, there must not be any. You know the facts but if you are united to Christ in his death and resurrection, here is the truth. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? 
as it is written, for your sakes we're being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know the scripture, but perhaps like John, you hadn't understood it. God's word is truth. And you have a truth too, a perspective on the truth. Your hardship, your pain, your anguish, your suffering, your anxiety, your fear. Those things are all true. And they're all things that you can bring to Jesus and cast upon him because he cares for you. For those of you who are suffering, that's your truth. But by the grace of God, can you bring your truth into conformity with what God's word says is the truth? I'm going to ask our elders if they'd come to distribute the elements of the Lord's table. John Calvin made the observation that the death and the resurrection of Jesus cannot be separated, that they go together. And that even in those very few passages that speak only of his death or only of his resurrection, where the one is spoken of, the other is implied. And today, as we partake of this supper, we, we participate in his death. But participating in his death means of necessity that you participate in his resurrection as well. For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he given thanks, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you participate in the body and blood of the Lord. But let one examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Father, we give thanks to you for this bread, for the body of our Lord Jesus. But Father, as we partake of it, may we understand in doing so that we have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer we who live, but Christ lives in us. And the life which we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen.
Jesus took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. Our Father, we give you thanks for this cup, which is, as your word says, a participation in the blood of Christ. Our Father, Jesus did not die for himself but for our sins. And in his death, O oh Lord, you dealt with our sins. You tore us. Father, as we participate uh, in this cup, might we as your disciples take up the cross that Jesus called us to that we might die to ourselves live by faith in you amen Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. Drink it.
Our deacons are going to come and uh, take uh, the deacon's offering, a benevolent offering to minister the mercy of Christ to those inside the church and sometimes uh, those outside of it who are in need. And I encourage you to give generously to that fund. Our Father, you are the giver of all good gifts. We thank you for the gifts that you've given to your people. And Father, for your people in giving these gifts that your name might be made fully known. Pray that you'd bless us to that end. Bless also the meal that we partake of this afternoon. May we, uh, by that time together, encourage one another in our faithfulness to you. And Father, bless these gifts and those who give it in Jesus' name. Amen. To rise if you're able to, and we'll sing our closing hymn. dinner. And then may the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.